Okay, good morning. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum. I'm the chair of the Committee on Finance, and this hearing is uh, jointly being sponsored with the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, which is chaired by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. Uh, I'm joined by our colleagues, Councilmember Andy Cohen, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Brad Lander is here as well, and, and Councilmember Barry Grudenchik is here. Happy birthday, Barry. You don't look like Abraham Lincoln, but uh, you know. <laughs> uh, today we'll be uh, hearing. Uh, today we'll be hearing on two proposed pieces of legislation related to the capital projects. Uh, the first legislation is intro number 32 in relation to electronic notification of capital project delays and cost changes. The second legislation is intro number 113 in relation to the creation of a database to track citywide capital projects. This is the first hearing on both pieces of legislation. Intro number 32, sponsored by Council Member Cohen, would require that each city agency provide each affected council member, borough president, or community board with an electronic notification within 30 days of any projected or actual delay of 60 days or more, and any projected or actual change of 10% or more of the total estimated cost of a city capital project. The notification would need to include a clear explanation of the reasons for any projected or actual change in cost or delay of the capital project. The second piece of legislation, uh, legislation uh, intro number 113, sponsored by Council Member Lander, would require the city to establish and maintain a public online searchable and interactive database containing information on all pending capital projects. The data in the database must be searchable, searchable by a project name, borough, managing agency, and budget agency, and would need to include for each project the name of the project, the borough where the project is located, the current project phase, and information about the project schedule and cost, including estimated actual and variance information. In addition, intro number 113 would require that aggregated data on all pending capital projects citywide be included on the website, and that the website include an interactive map indicating the location of all capital projects. Investment in capital assets, such as streets, bridges, tunnels, sewers, parks, school buildings, and other important infrastructure, is essential to New York's economy and the quality of life of its residents. Transparency in the capital process is key to providing assurances to the public that city resources are being put into good use in an efficient and effective manner. Currently, there is no public-facing database that tracks all citywide capital projects. There is also no mechanism for city agencies to provide notice to the impacted elected officials and community representatives of cost changes and delays of capital projects. New York City residents want to know how well the government is performing in meeting its commitments on capital projects. And more often than not, they just want to know when the renovation of their kids' school will be finished, when construction will begin in their local park, or how much it costs to build the new library in their neighborhood. By providing the information required in these two pieces of legislation, the city will be better utilizing its existing resources to communicate meaningful information to the public and create a comprehensive centralized database that tracks all pending capital projects citywide. The database and interactive map would allow residents to view pending projects occurring in their neighborhoods. It will also allow for increased construction related data analyses, uh, which may be helpful for re revealing gaps in the capital project process and innovating change in current policies and practices on both an agency and citywide level. Finally, the proposed legislation would provide more frequent and targeted notice to relevant stakeholders of issues with capital projects of all city agencies. Overall, the two pieces of legislation would provide a measure to improve transparency, trust, and accountability in capital spending in New York City. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chair Gibson, who would like to also make a statement. Thank you, thank you, good morning. Thank you, Chair. 
Danny Drum, our chair of the Finance Committee. Good morning to each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. Welcome to City Hall. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson. I proudly serve as the chair of the subcommittee on the capital budget, and I'm excited to be joined here with our chair, Danny Drum, to be discussing two important pieces of legislation that I truly believe could significantly contribute to the city's ability to effectively and appropriately engage in capital planning, which has been the focus of this subcommittee's work over the past 13 months. The Charter requires a variety of capital budget and planning documents to be produced, which includes the capital budget, the capital commitment plan, the 10-year capital strategy, the citywide statement of needs, and the Asset Inventory Management System, also called AIMS Report. What has resulted from these charter requirements is sometimes a challenge of reporting measures and data tracking that often do not relate to one another or the city's real spending in a meaningful way. The Subcommittee on Capital has spent much of the last budget season working to address many of the shortcomings and challenges in the city's capital planning process, such as authorizations and plan commitments far above realistic spending targets, front loading of the commitment plan, and a lack of discrete lines for projects in the budget. While we've made significant progress on improving the capital budget and the commitment plan to be more in line with reality, there is much more work to be done. This is especially true in a year when we also have a 10-year capital strategy. This morning, we are hearing legislation that would really move us beyond these budget documents to give the City Council and the public a holistic and detailed look at all capital projects that are in progress throughout the city. We believe that citywide tracking of capital projects is something the mayor's office and agencies should already be doing. Moreover, as Chair Drum said, understanding what is actually happening during the execution of capital projects would really improve the city's ability to accurately forecast capital budget needs as well as spending. There is sometimes a tired anecdote about park projects taking upwards of eight years to complete, and many of us have eight years as a term, and park bathrooms are costing many millions more than they should. While there are specific examples to back up many of these claims, we simply should not base the overall assessment of an agency's capital project management on discrete examples. Rather, what we should do is conduct a data-driven assessment of all capital projects to determine if there are particular types of projects or particular points in the capital budget process that are typically over budget or delayed then resources to improve capital planning can be appropriately targeted. Importantly, from a budgeting perspective, having a true understanding of how long capital projects take, how much they cost, and why, allows us to create a realistic capital budget. So I look forward this morning to hearing testimony from the Mayor's Office of Operations on both intro 32 and intro 113, and following up as necessary during our preliminary budget hearings, which will begin next month. I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. And I want to thank again Chair Danny Drum and all of my colleagues who are here. Want to wish Councilmember Barry Gredenchik a happy birthday as well. Again, hope you enjoy your day. And also want to thank the staff uh, for really all of their work in putting today's hearing together. Our senior counsel, Rebecca Chasen, our assistant counsel, Stephanie Ruiz, and our senior financial analyst, Caitlin O'Hagan. And with that, I turn this hearing back over to Chair Danny Drum. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair Gibson. We'll now hear from the prime sponsors of the two bills who would like to share a few words with us on the proposed legislation. Council Member Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll be brief, but my frustration with the capital process, I think, is uh, I've made a, a lengthy record on that here. I see representatives from Parks and DDC, uh, and I spend a significant amount of my time when I'm dealing with capital projects on projects that were funded by my predecessor, never mind uh, my, my own projects. Um, and I, I will tell you, even though uh, I do love my job, one thing I'm not crazy about is going to community board meetings and civic associations 
and having people ask me about city projects and you know, are we ever going to see them start, never mind finished. Uh, and month after month, year after year, over and over again, uh, I find myself on the front line with this and it's not fun and it's embarrassing. Uh, the, the, the inability of the city to deliver on capital projects, is, it, it is an epidemic, it is, uh, my frustration is uh, really beyond, uh, we don't have enough time in this hearing for me to express my, uh, my full frustration. But I think at the very least, and what Intro 32 tries to get it, is that the city has an affirmative duty to uh, provide information in an active manner. Not, it, it's one thing for people to be able to go search you know, online. I think you have an affirmative duty when you're, not go, when you're not doing what you said you were going to do initially, you have an affirmative duty to tell us that you're not do, you're, we're not able to keep our word. We said we were gonna meet this timeline or this budget, we're not gonna be able to do that. And so we're coming back to tell you. I mean, you know, I chase down agencies and get them to come to community boards, but that, again, that shouldn't be, it's not fun, I don't enjoy doing it. And again, I think that, that the city has an affirmative duty to do that, and I think that's what Intro 32 gets at, and I hope that uh, my colleagues will ultimately support it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Landon. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Drum and Chair Gibson. It's an honor to have this bill heard together along with Councilmember Cohen's. Uh, as both our chairs pointed out, New York City's aging infrastructure is suffering from a cycle of overdue and poorly planned investments. Many of our water mains and bridges are over a century old. And with every year, we struggle to keep pace with routine maintenance, even as we fall further and further behind the curve in making critical forward-looking investments from broadband to renewable energy to storm protection. Um, meanwhile, we all know it, we've heard it, our capital projects management system just remains in need of dramatic reform. Uh, we're releasing a kind of issue update today of the larger projects that are on the capital projects dashboard, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, about half of the projects are either over budget or substantially delayed. It's 47% uh, over budget and 53% delayed of the projects on the capital projects dashboard. Um, uh, and I'll talk in just a second about the shortcomings of the dashboard. Now, I do wanna give some uh, credit or signs of uh, uh, glimmers of light. You know, last month under the leadership of the new Commissioner Lorraine Grillo, and I see First Deputy Commissioner Jamie Springer here, the New York City Department of Design and Construction issued a promising blueprint for streamlining procurement, technology, and project management that I think offers some steps forward. But um, we need a lot more aggressive action, and we need a partnership from City Hall and from OMB, not only from DDC, if we are really going to have a serious coordinated system with reform that can deliver uh, the kinds of improvements that we need. And I do think the, the tracker, you know, though it's only one of many things that is needed, is a pretty good place to start. You know, there's an old adage, uh, what you don't measure, you can't manage. Uh, and we're not even measuring our capital projects. Um, the capital projects dashboard covers projects over $25 million, but that is fewer than 2% of the city's capital projects. So more than 98% of them, there is not information available online. And that really cuts a few different ways. First, for the New Yorker who voted for a project in participatory budgeting or worked so hard to make sure that their school was repaired or their park was improved, they can't have any way that they can find what the status of that project is leading to the kinds of frustrations that, that Council Member Cohen talked about. But it also means it's impossible for City Hall to take a comprehensive look at our capital projects management system and say in any coherent way, which agencies are doing well, which agencies are doing poorly, which contractors are not meeting their obligations, what kinds of strategies for improvement are working, uh, and what strategies are failing. And we can't do that until we have a unified system that both provides transparency to the public, but also is a tool for management. Now, one other thing I have to point out about the capital projects dashboard today, even with only covering fewer than 2% of the projects, even the updates are long delayed. The capital projects dashboard has not been updated. If you go look at it today, since August of 2018, uh, the open data portal says it's supposed to be updated quarterly, which means today's updates are 67% behind schedule. So we have some serious work to do if we want to achieve the kinds of reforms that are needed. 
um, and that were outlined in the DDC report, but we've got shared work to do to push them a lot harder. One other note I just want to make is in addition to today's hearing, the Council last week released our recommendations to the Charter Revision Commission, uh, and I know staff and the chairs and others developed some good recommendations there that speak to additional ways that require charter uh, uh, changes and therefore a referendum. Uh, that includes updating and improving the Ames report that Chair Gibson spoke to. Um, the School Construction Authority actually does a really good annual assessment of every item in its infrastructure, but the rest of the city does not have a really serious process for reviewing the conditions of assets today in a way that would genuinely help us know what state of good repair looked like. Um, the DDC report speaks a little to that, but we need charter changes to make that a really meaningful report. We need the kinds of changes to the budget process that both chairs have long spoken for so that you can find individual capital projects in the budget instead of in giant bundles that make it impossible to really uh, know what's going on. And we need the documents that Chair Gibson spoke to to really speak to one another in a deeper way so that instead of just being a series of disconnected reports, they add up to a real plan for infrastructure investment. So this is a good hearing to have, and I really want to thank the chairs and the staff for their work. Um, you know, I think we all know this is a longstanding problem. The analysis my office is putting out today makes clear it's ongoing. Um, but I'm going to take the optimistic side. We're having this hearing. Uh, we've got some new leadership at DDC. This is a moment when I believe we can really drive real change and improvement and the future of our city. It's just no exaggeration to say the future of our city depends on it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Lander. I will now, we will now begin the testimony uh, from Daniel Steinberg, Senior Policy Advisor at the Mayor's Office for Operations and James Barrazzo. And I'm going to ask uh, Council to swear you in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Drum, Chair Gibson, and members of the Finance Committee and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. My name is Daniel Steinberg, and I'm a senior advisor at the Mayor's Office of Operations. At, op at Operations, we're dedicated to making New York City government as effective and efficient as possible through rigorous project and performance management, data analysis, and research. In that vein, Operations created and now manages the New York City Capital Projects dashboard. Thank you for the opportunity to present some of our work in this area and discuss the relevant legislation currently under consideration. The City of New York's capital budget apportions the city's funds to pay for everything from the maintenance of our bridges to the construction of our schools and making sure our offices are equipped with computers and furniture. My office, alongside our partners at the City Council wanted to provide policymakers and the public with a better view into and transparency around the city's construction and information technology projects. Working with the Financial Information Services Agency, OMB, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, and the experts at capital agencies, we launched the Capital Projects Dashboard in 2014. Today, the Capital Projects Dashboard provides insight into all capital construction and information technology projects with budgets over $25 million using standardized metrics for all agencies and projects, including timelines, budget, the dashboard serves as a centralized repository for oversight of and comparisons between capital projects. Since launching in 2014, our office has made changes to the dashboard in the interest of providing even greater transparency and accessibility to the public, including reorganizing the web portal around project categories that are meaningful to residents, such as parks, streets, and schools, expanding project level details to include schedule, and budget change history by reporting periods and adding this data to the city's open data por portal where data can be exported and analyzed as you did so well. <laughs> um, um, I'll now take some time to speak about the proposed legislation being considered today, um, intros 113 and 32. Intro 113 aims to provide greater insight for policymakers and the public through a centralized database of capital project information, which was our goal in building and updating the capital projects dashboard. Operations agrees with the spirit of Intro 113 and with many of its components. However, we're concerned that the bill as written would require reporting on every capital project regardless of its size or type. Uh, there are more than 10,000 individual projects classified as capital, which include everything from City Water Tunnel 3 to paper shredders for, for libraries. The dashboard currently tracks nearly 300 projects by applying a cost threshold of $25 million because the data process 
The data collection process is manual and labor intensive. Reporting out on over 10,000 projects um, would be impractical and of limited value. We're also concerned with the proposed monthly reporting frequency. Most capital projects have multi-year timelines that do not change month to month. The capital projects dashboard is currently updated three times annually, in, uh, not quarterly, in sync, and apologies if that was uh, wrong in open data, um, in sync with the triannual release of the city's capital commitment plans. This ensures the high quality and reliability of data and we therefore recommend maintaining this reporting frequency. However, as noted, we do agree with the spirit and most of the substance of the bill. We're happy to have further conversations with the council and believe we can reach a solution that would satisfy our mutual goals. Intro 32 aims to provide more frequent updates to the public and policymakers when capital projects are delayed or see cost increases. As with Intro 113, operations agrees with the spirit of this bill. We're concerned, however, that the reporting mechanism laid out in Intro 32 would be incredibly burdensome to implement while providing little new information. While I cannot speak to any individual's uh, agency's exact process, um, the capital agencies maintain their own protocols for notifying affected elected officials and impacted community stakeholders when projects and their neighborhoods are delayed, which in many cases go beyond the standards proposed in this bill. As each agency delivers projects of varying size and nature, it would be very difficult and costly to set a standardized mechanism and time frame for this type of notification across thousands of projects. As I've stated, my office agrees with the spirit of this bill uh, and its important aim of increasing transparency. We would welcome uh, an opportunity to discuss improved approaches to ensure that you and the communities you serve receive the information you need and deserve. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to continuing the conversation and answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And let me just start by announcing we've been joined by Councilmember Steve Matteo, Councilmember Francisco Moya, Councilmember Rory Lansman as well. I think I got everybody now. Okay, um, let me just start off by asking a few questions. Um, wh uh, which office within the mayor's office is responsible for overseeing the delivery of capital projects across all agencies? That would be us, the mayor's office of operations. Okay, and which deputy mayor has oversight over the mayor's office of operations? The first deputy mayor, Dean Fullahan. Okay. What role does operations play in the capital tracking process and what role does OMB play? Uh, operations collects the data um, uh, from the agencies and um, obviously we, we post it on our website but we also um, report the data directly to deputy mayors and, and commissioners um, when the data is updated. How many staff are currently in the Office of Operations and how many work on the Capital Projects dashboard? I don't know the total staff when it includes 311 and, and the other divisions within Ops, but um, right now there's about um, no no one's dedicated full time to the capital projects dashboard, but there's about four people who do work on it. So four people work on it throughout the year. Right. <clears throat> Does the mayor's office have re uh, regular check-ins with agencies um, about the progress of their capital uh, programs beyond checking in on the status of individual projects? We do. Um, we, we circulate the um, data to commissioners um, every time it's updated, and we often have uh, meetings both on, on specific projects for the purpose of troubleshooting, um, but we're always looking for opportunities for systemic reform also, and, and that's sort of um, been uh, informed some of the larger strategic planning efforts that, that we've discussed today. How, how often do those meetings occur? Um, I guess I would, I would say as needed, but clearly they're needed frequently, and they do happen frequently. Um, in the past, we've had specific meetings about uh, programs that, that, uh, that the data suggested needed, needed attention, but, and, um, but also on, on specific projects. So are those agencies required to submit periodic reports about the status of capital projects? Yes. Um, Intro number 113 proposes to collect information on capital projects in three phases, uh, which include the design phase, the construction procurement phase, and the construction phase. Uh, is this consistent with how the mayor's office or agencies track capital projects? It is, although you, you, um, there are standard phases that, that are useful for, for uh, the purpose of data integration <coughs> and standardization, but, but it is also true that agencies often have their own um, idiosyncrasies when it comes to the way that certain terminology is defined and 
Um, so, so that is sort of at the heart of, of why a centralized repository is a challenging endeavor, but one that we all deem worthwhile also. So do you collect data like uh, such as scope design procurement or furniture equipment purchase, construction management, things like that? Um, we collect mostly s schedule and budget data, but, but also data pertaining to the contractors. Um, I'm not sure if you, you want to. Uh, it doesn't, the data we collect doesn't go down to that level of detail. We collect uh, the time and budget on the phases that you mentioned. So there's no way to track things like furniture, purchases, equipment, things like that? Not through our dashboard. I in the agencies, do they have that data? They do, but, um, but in stored in, in different systems. Is there ever a review of those systems? I can't speak to that, it, not from the standpoint of the capital projects dashboard. So nobody, so you don't know whether or not those agencies are looking at those systems to determine whether things like equipment's been delivered or, or any of those items? I think only the agencies can, can speak to their own protocols when it comes to equipment uh, kind of purchases. Basically you're saying there's no overall system to track that? Equipment purchases. Uh, um, well, any, any of the items that I'm, I mentioned. I'm not quite saying that. I'm saying that our capital projects dashboard doesn't track equipment purchases. I, I can't speak to but whether it's there's another. But it's the same thing basically as saying there's no overall system. Because it, it's done by agency. You're saying it's done by agency, but there's no overall system to track any of this. For equipment purchases that meet Well, what about right. for um, construction management, a, a design, procurement, those items within those agencies? Most agencies do have project management systems that track those. But not those overall. So, uh, my understanding is that you only track things that are 25 million and above. That's right. But anything under 25 million is not tracked. That's not in our system. Right. So, you know, that excludes a lot of things that, uh, particularly things I think the constituents are concerned about. Those larger than 25 um, million dollar projects are, are, are bigger things and, and, and obviously they're easier for us to track, but oftentimes it's the smaller ones that we get <laughs> questions about. So why does the uh, capital projects dashboard only report on projects, oh, I said that already, about 25 million. Is there anything that would prevent you from reporting on larger category of projects? Well, uh, we started with that um, threshold as a way to, to, to capture the, the largest, most complex projects that um, often relate to our, our critical infrastructure, such as water supply. Um, and um, it, because the universe of capital projects is so large and there's no technological solution that, that can immediately integrate all of this data in one place. Um, it's a very labor intensive and manual data collection process. So the decision was made when the da dashboard was created to, to go with a threshold of 25 million or above. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you say we started with the uh, 25 million and above, which indicates a willingness to perhaps go to the ones that are below 25 million as well. Yeah, we, we fully share your desire to, 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 to expand what's covered. Um, it's really a matter of, of uh, measure, kind of balancing what's feasible and what's real, most valuable to you and your constituents. And uh, Council Member Lander uh, mentioned that the dashboard has not been updated since um, August of 18, uh, nearly six months ago. How often is information updated and when can we expect the next update? It's updated three times a year and the next update should be imminent with, with the passage of the budget recently. Or, so or with the, the also said it was 67 budget. days behind? I think I said it was 67, but then I'm understanding it's a triennial, it's only 50 percent. Yes, I bought us some time. Yeah. So when can we expect that to be updated? Well, as Dan said, it's a manual process. So with uh, uh, and following the budget cycle, it, it will be completed as soon as possible once. Uh, how many capital projects are currently being tracked in the dashboard? Just under 300. And what, um, uh, what percentages of all capital projects are, ca are captured? Well, as, as uh, Councilmember Lander mentioned, uh, uh, All right. certainly a, a small percentage, um, uh, th but that's all, you know, taking into account that many capital projects are, are equipment purchases and, and, and that sort of thing. But. Um, okay, do you know how the mayor's office responds to public inquiries about capital projects? 
uh, when asked by constituents? Do you refer them to like a, any agency, the managing agency or? I'm not quite sure how to answer the question on behalf of the entire mayor's office. The operations doesn't have a, a lot of direct correspondence uh, uh, with the public, but we try to be responsive to, to you know, uh, most of those questions are channeled through deputy mayors and their staff, and, and we're very fast and responsive whenever they come through. Okay, so to me, it seems like we have a lot of work to do here, um, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Gibson. Thank you, Chair. Good morning again. Um, just keeping in line with uh, the, con the questions that the Chair asked and based on your testimony. So I'm first very concerned. This is 2019, and the Mayor's Office of Operations is talking about a manual data collection system. You have four staff that are not dedicated to <coughs> even managing the tracking system. So that from the onset is concerning to me. Um, if there is a real recognition that tracking capital projects is really a priority in this city, number one, we need dedicated staff. That's just, that goes without question. Um, I am concerned, as Councilmember Landa talked about, that this system you have, the capital projects dashboard, only tracks projects at 25 million or above. Um, most of the capital projects I've allocated in my five years here have all been less than $25 million. So none of my capital projects in five years would even be tracked on this dashboard. So, I mean, there are lots of things that we are generally concerned about, but what I wanna understand is, is the Mayor's Office of Operations um, understanding that, number one, the tracking system at 25 million, we need to change that and make some changes to the amount. Is that a consideration that you guys would take up? It's certainly a discussion we're willing to have. I, I should have mentioned, of course, that Parks Department d does have a, a fairly robust dashboard of its own. Um, yes. And, and, um, um, and I, I, I should also defer to my colleague to sort of describe some of the, the technical difficulties behind integrating data from, from legacy systems at agencies. Okay, what's we, the name we of the get out of the We want to get out of the manual data collection game as much as anybody. Okay. Um, what's the name of the system you talked about? Oh, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay. Give it a name. I'm sorry. The, he said uh, legacy systems. Le oh, yeah, legacy si systems that have you know agencies have had for for a while that are very costly yes. to to Understand. replace. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, as of right now, the current tracking mechanisms that we have, besides the capital projects dashboard, Parks Department has a capital projects dashboard, New York City Facilities Explorer, SCA has a quarterly report. The NYPD has a quarterly report on capital projects that are council funded. We have a Sandy funding tracker, and we also have a neighborhood zoning commitment tracker. So the concern and what we're trying to do with the legislation put forth is not only have a conversation about some of the inconsistencies we have, but really develop some sort of a centralized system where at least agencies are talking to each other so I guess the first question I have to ask is, does the administration believe that the Mayor's Office of Operations is the best agency to oversee the capital tracking system that the legislation is calling for? Well, we can't speak for the entire Mayor's Office, but I think the Mayor's Office of Operations thinks that. Okay, so if you think that, um, what steps would you propose to take to provide a more streamlined process that isn't so manual data driven. Can we jump into 2019? Well, as, as Dan mentioned, the, the challenge is less with uh, the ability of us to build a repository to receive the data, but the fact that each agency uses separate uh, project management systems to manage their projects. So the source of the data is disparate, um, and we would need to integrate to many different systems, which would be a very large technical undertaking. As a first step, I should just say that, that when systems are replaced, replacing real uh, emphasis on making sure that they meet the requirements of, of what it would take to have an integrated system. and. Um, you might have noticed in DDC strategic plan there, there was a, 
a discrete initiative around their, their information technology strategy that, that we're very much aligned with and, and hope could be a partial solution. Okay, so how was the information that the Mayor's Office of Operations gets today, how was it captured? Is it fed from some sort of a centralized system to your unit? It's not? Uh, we have a, a web forum that agencies uh, populate. A web forum? And we have a, a database. That collects the information and, and feeds it to NYC. I know yeah. we're cringing up here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you sh you, you should see there. from our perspective. But. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. Uh, the central database for capturing information about capital projects um, across agencies is it FMS? I'm sorry. The Central, could you repeat the question? But the Central System for Capturing Information about Capital Projects across other agencies, uh, do they use the FMS system? Uh, FMS captures the budget information. It, uh, it's just as you laid out in the opening that FMS is a, is a system for managing um, the budget in a way that doesn't always um, speak to uh, the project level in the way that most people think about projects. Okay. One, one project can have several budget lines. One budget line can be implicating several projects. Okay. So tell me about the, the four staff that we have that part-time work on the tracking system. Well, what are their other responsibilities as well? Sure. Well, there's the, the two of us. Um, uh, you two are part of the four? Well, I'm not sure exactly <laughs> who, which four Dan was, was counting. The, the, system, the system does not require very much upkeep because it, it was built and it, it's robust. Um, we, uh, we have one, one technical person who uh, maintains the database and we have a, a designer who oversaw the uh, update that Dan mentioned in his testimony of the display of the information. Right, um, I, that, that was the division labor I was trying to get at, that um, uh, James Perrazzo is the, the architect and business owner of, of the system, and he has one person who's incredibly sophisticated uh, technical um, expertise who, who manages the content. Um, we have one person who's sort of a, a, an expert on visualization and, and helped make the dashboard more um, appealing and, um, and usable. And, um, and myself and, and people on, on um, my team often analyze the data. Um, and, and so that's sort of the division of labor in terms of how we all work with it. Okay, so is it the same office um, within the Mayor's Office of Operations whose responsibility it is to make sure that the Capital Projects dashboard is accurate, so is there an overseer that ensures that the dashboard and the information collected is accurate? Is there another layer of, of oversight within the office? Uh, there isn't another layer of oversight of the data. We work with agencies to ensure it's accurate and we, we have some rules in the, in the collection form to to help with that, um, and we, as Dan mentioned, his, the uh, when staff does analysis and and speaks to agencies, they do spot checks to see if the data is accurate. Are you uh, able to share with us some of the rules and guidelines that you talked about in terms of data collection? Yeah, we I, I believe we make them all public. Um, and we're happy to share them. We're proud of them because they're, they're you know, as, as you mentioned, they're, they're um, unforgiving and, and um, fully transparent. And, and that's the reason why Councilmember Lander was able to depend on them for his report and why we're very proud and, and happy to see people using the data. So we're, we're fully transparent, not just about the data, but about the, the rules that, that govern it. Okay. So what is it that you can offer us here in the council to greater understand what the administration is willing to do to capture the thousands of other capital projects that do not meet the $25 million threshold that we, 
need to have an understanding of the timeline, the cost, and delays, but also the general public. Uh, I share the frustration of Councilmember Cohen. Uh, we are always yelled at and criticized because it's really the onus is put on us to reach out to the relevant agency to find out where the project is and what's happening because the updates that we get are just simply, you know, just not consistent. So what we're trying to do with the legislation is develop some sort of a centralized system where there is more consistency ab across the board. Outside of the current tracking systems that we described, there's no way else and there's no other uh, mechanism that exists for us to track capital projects. So what can the Mayor's Office of Operations do with the current tracker you have to make the system better, but also what are you willing to do beyond that in terms of greater oversight with all of the other agencies that have uh, a capital budget? Well, we certainly want to work with you to better understand what, what data would be most valuable to capture. Um, 10,000 projects um, under the current uh, kind of technology environment would be difficult, um, but, but I think there is a way for us to figure out how to expand in a way that, that is really valuable for you. Um, and we're very open to also a discussion around the, um, the mapping uh, component, which, which is a part of Council Member Lander's proposed legislation and something that, that uh, value we, we share greatly that people should be able to know where the projects are and, and um, in relation to where they live and work. So um, th those are two things that we're th eager to, to continue discussing with you until we find this sweet spot that, that, that where the dashboard is both you know, is feasible and, and meaningful. Okay, so outside of the dashboard, does the Mayor's Office of Operations have an ongoing uh, interagency coordination with OMB or with DDC about other capital projects that are not necessarily tracked under the existing dashboard? And if so, how does that work? We've worked very closely with DDC on, on many of the systemic kind of reforms that, that are captured in, in the um, strategic plan, and much of which um, was informed by analysis over the past few years. And, and um, um, in terms of specific projects, um, um, I didn't bring a list, but over the years there have been you know, many specific projects that, that we've collaborated on to try to troubleshoot kind of acute problems. It could be anything from utility coordination um, to an interagency kind of dispute, um, but, but that's sort of our role in government is to, is to address those pain points. Okay, before I turn it back over to our, our chair, and certainly the co-sponsors I know have questions, um, I guess the concern I have is that there just isn't consistency. Um, it's troubling that we don't have sufficient staff at the Mayor's Office of Operations. I question the ability of the Mayor's Office of Operations to really oversee this entire uh, capital tracker system. Um, concerned that you know every agency seems to be doing their own thing, and you know with respect to just having more of a centralized system, to me it really makes sense that. If it's not the Mayor's Office of Operations, DDC manages a number of projects and has a number of client agencies, but also the role that OMB plays in approving all of these capital projects. So I think we have to tighten up the interagency coordination, but for my general understanding and to actually make this system work, um, having a system that's interactive, that's user friendly, uh, it's troubling that in 2019 we still have manual systems and not a significant amount of staff that should be dedicated to operating these tracker systems. The $25 million threshold is a problem for me because most projects are, are well below 25% and this certainly does not capture a large percentage of all the capital projects we have. Um, and then generally, if we are to be committed to ongoing just commitment rates and really making sure the system is operating more efficient. The 10-year capital plan just came out. We really have to do better. And so it's my hope um, that the administration will take a, a real look at this legislation that we have introduced to really have a real conversation about how we can work better, how these projects can be managed 
overall better, but to me, generally, there has to be a better system. I understand that there are thousands and thousands of capital projects, but I would argue that our constituents care just as much about the comfort station as they do about the mobile unit and some of the smaller capital projects that we are funding. Um, and there's an expectation, as Councilmember Landa mentioned, most of us are in participatory budgeting, and those projects are very important. We galvanize and organize in our communities and have residents come out and vote on these projects, and then when the budget is passed, there's an expectation that those projects will come online in what we all deem is reasonable. How we define reasonable varies, um, but I, I really hope that you guys will take a real look at this because what I've heard so far is not satisfactory, and I really think we have a lot more work to do. Um, if it's a centralized system and we can tie all of the agency's capital into one system, because generally speaking, the legislation is asking for, you know, timeline, scope of work, design, procurement. I mean, those are basic things that are, you know, common from agency to agency. So it's not as if one agency has a very unique project that wouldn't meet that threshold. Um, but centralizing and having one system where everyone can speak to each other, to me, um, says that we are really committed to making sure that the public understands that we are about efficiency and we're about spending their dollars wisely and getting a lot of these projects uh, online in a timely fashion. So uh, I look forward to working with you. I will circle back with more questions, but uh, I want to thank you for your presence here and at least letting us know what's been going on and, and how we can really address a lot of the inconsistencies that we believe exist today. And hopefully this legislation will give us the uh, reassurance uh, and the confidence that we really need moving forward to make sure that this system is much more operable and it's not a manual system um, and it's automatic in, in the 2019 year. Uh, thank you. I'll turn it back over to Chair Drum. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair Gibson. And I concur with you that uh, this is a top priority for this council since uh, Speaker Johnson has been uh, elected. Uh, he created the position that you currently hold specifically to look at this based on the number of complaints that council members have regarding capital projects. And if you look at council member Lander's legislation, he has a super majority on there. So this is definitely something that we want to continue to look at. I'm going to turn it over now to council member Cohen who has questions and then council member Lander, and then we'll go to other folks for questions. Uh, thank you, chair. Um, again, uh, you know, I'm going to push back a little on the idea that, you know, the 10,000 projects is not a manageable universe of projects. Uh, it has to be a manageable use of projects. You know, we're, it's a city of eight and a half million people. I think that we, you know, we have the bandwidth to actually have a centralized, I mean, and it's, you know, and the, the data is of value. It would be important to know that agency by agency, you know, if one agency is spending, you know, $2,000 on a chair and one agency is spending $500 on a chair, that's worthwhile, important, it's important data to collect. And, you know, and also in a, in a city where, you know, I have to tell constituents that a, a dog run costs $2 million and a bathroom costs $5 million, I believe we could find the resources to centralize the data collection. And honestly, I feel like it is just reflective of that this is not a priority, that, you know, eventually there will be some horrific scandal that things, you know, things are going you know, terribly wrong. And that will ultimately cause real reform, but it, it just does not, I, I have no sense that there is any urgency around the, the, the sorry state uh, and of our ability to deliver on, on capital projects. Uh, you know, one thing I, I, I'm interested in, and maybe, and I, go, I know it doesn't exactly go to data, but um, uh, DDC, when DDC gets involved in a project, like I have a parks project that is, of course, horrendously screwed up, but it's a, now it's a DDC project. What, when does, when, you, can you t explain to us a little bit about when that happens? And really a case-by-case -case basis. DDC um, didn't used to take many parks projects at all historically and have begun to take more. Um, I don't know the circumstances behind that project. I'd be yet. happy to share them, but it, uh, well, like what about DOT or other, when, when does, is, well, is, there, is there any kind sure. of criteria well, that? DDC, um, largely handles the linear street work, which is, um, which requires a lot of coordination between agencies like DOT and DEP, and, and they've been that fair broker in, in that sort of um, um, 
uh, driver of, of the coordination. And, and so projects like that often up, end up in the DDC portfolio. And, and um, um, one important reform that's part of the um, strategic blueprint is the creation of front end planning, um, which happened a couple of years ago and, and which has really started to expand and, and make an impact. And, and uh, front end planning is, is really the first time DDC's had the ability to properly scope projects with the involvement of the, the, uh, the agencies that are sponsoring them. Uh, and that's the sort of reform that we think will improve the data over time. Um, these are multi-year projects, so it takes a long time to see the impact of any of these interventions, but we measure the impact of each one. Yeah, and okay, I'm not always sure even that we're, that we're measuring, like, you know, again, uh, uh, I'm picking on parks only because it, it's a, you know, it's a passion of mine, parks and trying to make sure that, but I do believe that some of the, the reform in reporting is sort is, you know, a manipulation of the data that we, you know, one reform that I, I found, reform, that I found particularly irritating was that we, you know, in my, I think in the common sense, sense of a project, I funded the project in June, projects fully funded, um, but Parks has decided oh, we got a night, you know, we'll clip five months off of the project by not counting the start time until we're actually ready to scope it or do something. So the money just sits around idle while, while something, while nothing is happening, I guess. So even, it, again, it's, the data is really just the tip of the iceberg here. There are just so many, um, it's it's just you know so frustrating and I, and I wonder like on the on the large scale projects that you know council members you know I fund two million dollar pro you know five million dollar project whatever you know but you know I have no sense at all on some of these massive city projects you know my district is home to the you know the infamous infamous uh, Croton filtration water plant that was you know nine hundred million that cost three billion and change I mean it, there's just such a you know and again there's no particular outrage or about these projects. I don't know if there's a question in here or I'm just <laughs> rambling on about my frustration. I'm going, yes, I, I'm going to turn it back to the chair, but I, uh, you know, and I think I've made my point about the fragmented data. All right, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Quite understandable, and I have to say, because I heard testimony before also about parks, yes, they have a system, but even that system is deeply flawed. And, um, you know, um, you go onto that system and, and the dates are all off, it's not updated, it, 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 they don't even know um, what, what information they're putting in there. So it's a whole, that's a whole other issue, but we could go on and on. Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you guys for being here. And, and I want to uh, push in the spirit of getting to the right place here. Like, I mean, yes, it's, you know, the gotcha of the tracker being behind is, is part of the pushing for us to get this right. It's hard. What we're asking to, for the change we're asking for here is not simple, and I don't want to pretend it's simple. And so I want to ask some questions about what it's going to take to really get there, because I think um, pretending it's easier than it is will not help us get it right. Um, and I think that will take more coordination than we yet have amongst the city's capital agencies. Um, and I think that will take more seriousness about getting to a system that's actually a management tool and not a kind of something slapped on top of all the existing systems, which is what we have now. And I, I didn't even know what you said today about the web form, which is when I started banging my head, because the reason I got into all of this was when we started doing participatory budgeting eight years ago, I felt like we had inherited an obligation to report to people who had voted for those projects on what their status was. That seemed just sort of obvious to me. So at first I thought, surely there must be a place in the city's budget or online where you can just point to people. And when we learned there wasn't, we then assigned staff in our office to do what it sounds like the mayor's office uh, of operations is doing, to just call all the agencies every quarter and ask for updates on the project. And we put up a tracker online for capital projects in the 39th district allocated by my office. Um, so I know just how clunky uh, that system is, and it can't be what we expand here. Like, it will not work. It's not only that it won't work to expand it to 10 or 15,000, it won't work to expand it to 1,000 to rely on after people manage their projects in some other system, then they have an extra responsibility every so often in a way that's of no use or value to them 
they have to go over somewhere else and enter it into a web form. Like that cannot be the way we expand this if we want the, the tool we have. So I wanna just ask some questions about how, what it would look like to get to the tool we need. So I guess one thing I wanna ask is, are you guys familiar with the tool that the School Construction Authority uses for tracking their projects? We haven't looked at it in years, but um, it sounds like we should. Uh, you haven't looked at it in years? Okay, uh, because- What's the name of the tool? Uh, do, well, if you go to the New York City Open Data Portal, uh -huh. uh, every quarter the School Construction oh, Authority, no, yeah. um, I don't know what the name of the, I'd love to know the name of the software or the system that they use. And the new commissioner of the Department of Design and Construction, I think, was there throughout the time at the SCA when they built this system. But it got just dumped into the Open Data Portal, the most recent update on February 1st. And it has I, I, 10,000 rows. So it leads me to believe that they are tracking every equipment purchase, and every capital project, and, and I have to believe, though I don't know for sure, that that means it's integrated into the way they're managing their projects, that it isn't this kind of layer on top. Right. Obviously, somebody knows when a piece of equipment is delivered and installed, that is recorded. So it's definitely true that if what you have is an old piece of legacy software where someone records that in like DEP's system, and then somebody else is re responsible for putting it into FMS to tell OMB that the check, you know, that the check was paid and the thing was delivered, and somebody else is responsible for filling out a web form to put it in the capital projects tracker, it's not gonna work. And it seems to me that must not be what's happening if, with the SCA's tracker, um, or I don't see how they could maintain the level of data that they have there. So my hunch is that they've built a system that I, you know, I don't know whether folks have it on their handhelds in the field, and when a change order is approved, it goes into the system, you know, each of the steps along the way. But, so one, I, I guess I would, um, I'm enthusiastic that you guys are open to doing this with us. Um, I am mindful of the challenges, so I wanna be realistic in the steps and time to get there. We may need to expand it in kind of some stages, the, the goal, does have to be every project. So let me be clear, like, it is irresponsible not to have a tracking system that tracks every project, including equipment purchases. But I understand we can't have that tomorrow. So how we're gonna do it is gonna take some work, but I guess it sounds to me like we're just at the beginning of that work. So let me ask a couple of coordination questions. I mean, I was, as I mentioned before, encouraged by the new DDC report, which reflects an effort to try to address some of the kinds of issues members have been talking about here today. Can you just, like, what is the relationship in capital projects management between the Mayor's Office of Operations and DDC? I'm not sure which question to answer first, but, you know, obviously the SCA, I guess you didn't ask a question on that, but the SCA example is perfect and elegant as that system may be. All of our challenges obviously are across agencies and not necessarily with, although there are some very legitimate challenges even within um, some of the capital agencies, especially smaller ones. But, um, but in terms of our work with EDC, um, we um, have been sort of immersed in, in, in the work that led up to the strategic plan over the past few years. And um, our office was very instrumental in, in the creation of the front end planning unit and a lot of the analysis that sort of demonstrated the need for, for better um, scoping and pre-design work. Um, we worked very closely with them on, on certain programs. We, there was a, we had a monthly cadence for a long time around Southeast Queens and, and a lot of the work um, that's happening related to the uh, build out of, of gray infrastructure and green infrastructure and flood alleviation. Um, and, and we've uh, worked with them on, on specific projects also. Um, so it's, it's not easy to define it in, in any one way, but, but we do work in cl closely with them. And, and, I, yeah, yeah. and I'm not, again, I'm pushing here a little because I, I think the challenge of getting a good tracking system exposes the flaws in our coordination. Um, so I, you know, some of the capital agencies report to the first deputy mayor, yes, and some to the deputy mayor for economic development and housing. And deputy mayor of operations. And some yeah. to the deputy mayor of operations. So at what level is there responsibility for a strategic coordinated look at capital projects delivery for the city? Well, Deputy Mayor Anklin really has um, 
um, taken the lead on, on that work in a universal way, although Deputy Mayor Glenn does have, uh, uh, I think bi-weekly, if not, uh, it may be monthly, but I think bi-weekly meetings with um, Commissioner Silver where capital is discussed at every meeting. But um, um, Deputy Mayor England uh, more formally kind of led the internal charge um, around a lot of these reform efforts that, that led into DDC's strategic plan. But it, I mean, and with, with due respect to, to, to her, for sure, it sounds a little more like you're describing a kind of consulting role than a supervisory role. She has been doing work, developing a kind of like consulting process to think about what's working, not, she's not responsible for capital project delivery in agencies that don't report to her. Uh -huh. Right, although DDC does build projects for agencies that don't report to her and they report to her. So it's, it's, a, it's a convoluted. Um, okay, but I mean, but, I yeah. think the answer is that there's no one below the mayor oh, uh -huh. to whom, who has a unified strategic responsibility for capital projects delivery in the city, which I just think is one of the challenges we're facing or one of the recommendations in this issue brief I have this morning is to create a deputy mayor for infrastructure. That won't magically solve anything. And I'm not trying to propose it or the dashboard as a silver bullet, but I, I just, I, I'm, and I, so as we move forward with you to figure out how to get the dashboard done uh, so that we are providing transparent information to New Yorkers on every capital project so they know what's going on at the school, you know, whatever, the school one they can actually find in the SCA report, but um, so they know what's going on with the street repair on their corner. Um, and as we're building a unified system that can be analyzed to see what's working and not working and start to identify trends and be used as a management tool, um, I think I, I just want to make sure we're looking at coordination, both on the information side, right? It, it, there is FMS, which I know you said only speaks to, uh, to financial issues, but our staff were showing me there's, there's columns in it that speak to project dates and speak to reasons for delays. So, it, it shouldn't be that kind of FMS is seg segmented from this system, is segmented from the systems that the agencies are actually using. Um, I, I get that it's not gonna be like this to, to reinvent that, but if we're really serious about the kind of reform we're trying to deliver, I, I hope we can do is not only negotiate bill text and agree on like dates and numbers, but have a, a real dialogue that's part of the reforms that are currently underway um, and that aims to get to, um, you know, both a more efficient system and a higher level of coordination across them. From our perspective, the, the better you understand our challenges, the better the solution will be. So we're very much looking forward to that work together. Yeah. Okay. Um, my head is still bruised from banging it on the table. Um, and I, um, so I, I'm gonna try to balance like my note of optimism with, because I do appreciate, like you're being here and saying, we wanna work with you to get it done is, is encouraging. I, I didn't expect that necessarily this morning and I really look forward to working with both chairs to get it done. Um, but I think both the frustration that every member has with so many of their projects and the urgency of a system that's got a creaky 100 year old infrastructure that we all have a responsibility to do a better job than we have been of maintaining and paying attention to is something that it's just easy to let slip for all of us. You know, tomorrow morning you wake up and there's a crisis and it demands our attention and the long term work to be stewards of to take care of the infrastructure and deliver capital projects in a better way is harder to give the attention to that it really needs. So um, do we have your commitment to keep it at that level of attention? Of course. Right. I, I don't think I'm in a place to commit to anything beyond working together and, and, and trying to find a, a, mm -hmm. a solution. But, um, but yes. That'll be our starting place. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We've been joined by Councilmember Powers, Van Bramer, and Cornegy, and we're going to have questions now from Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, followed by Councilmember Powers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And what could be more fun than spending my birthday at a <laughs> council finance hearing, except for also having a subcommittee hearing wrapped around that as well. Um, uh, this very important matter, and um, you know, I view this legislation, these two pieces of legislation, as kind of like getting to the tip of the iceberg because we are in a very, very sorry state. And um, 
I don't even know where to begin. Um, I want to echo Chair Gibson's concern. She said there has to be a better system, and there really has to be, because um, it is just taking forever to do things. And I know that Parks is here, and I have the honor of chairing the Parks. There's like 73 different steps that it takes to go from starting a project to finishing a project. And I don't know if it took that many steps to get to the moon. You know, it's just, this is just uh, impossible. And my colleagues have asked some excellent questions, but I want to know, has there been internal discussions at the mayor's office of the operation? I have discussed this uh, with the first deputy mayor, but um, I'm concerned not only about the this legislation that will do the tracking, but how do we eliminate these steps? I mean, it's just, you know, in parks, it goes from parks, and, and there are very smart lawyers there, and then it goes to Mox, and this one, and that is, is just too many steps. Can you talk about that a little, even a little? Sure. I mean, I, the, you're right that, um, that there are um, lots of, you know, a lot of these steps sort of uh, uh, amount to controls, you know, to, to, to make sure that the city is doing things in a, um, uh, with integrity. Um, so uh, at the same time, we're always looking for opportunities to streamline these processes. And, and you know, I think that the, the rollout of the new procurement system o over time is gonna help with a lot of that. Um, How long is it gonna take to roll out that system? I'm, I'm very happy that Ms. Grillo is at DDC. I've worked with her for decades. She's wonderful, um, you know, but um, we really, 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 and I'm hopeful that the council will hold a hearing on this soon, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Um, but I just want to, you know, add to my colleagues' frustration today. Um, I get a lot of questions about, you know, timing on parks projects, and I think ha uh, Commissioner Silver and his team have uh, certainly have cut a, a month or two, at least, off, uh, maybe more, off the uh, off the process. But that takes a long time to get results, and I, I think it really, um, you know. Stuff like water and sewer, it's not sexy. Parks are sexy, libraries are sexy. Um, you know, a water project just isn't, but it's critically important, um, more so than just about anything else that we do. So we really need to, to bear down on this, and I just hope you'll take that message back to the, to the other side of City Hall. I will, and I also just um, to re remind um, everyone that I think we have a shared legislative agenda uh, uh, in Albany when it comes to some of these issues, and a lot of the extra steps um, are um, possible to, to uh, tackle with design build yeah, and some I mean, of those tools. So. Those steps were put in to protect us from ourselves, but they're really just hurting us. So um, that's all. I just I, I share the the, uh, the the frustration of this horseshoe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you to both chairs for doing this uh, hearing. I, I'm only in year two, so I haven't had the, the frustration yet in terms of delays on projects, but certainly talk to my colleagues often about both the expense and the, uh, and the delays in it, so I can empathize, and I appreciate everybody being here to talk about it. <laughs> um, just two very quick questions. I, everybody sort of echoed most of the sentiment of the council, I think, here. Um, one is, I, I know I see DDC here, um, with, the, with the Sandy Capital Tracker that exists today, is that going to account for the work that's being planned ahead in terms of the East Coast Resiliency Plan? So are we going to be able to see the, uh, the progress of projects in terms of contracts, timeline, and, uh, and scope of project on that site? My office doesn't manage that tracker, so I, I, I truly don't know. Um, I think that's, is, it, is that the Office of Resiliency? Sure. So can I invite um, first? Yes, I think he's got to get some Mr. Morning. Springer to the board. He thought he was not going to even have to get up today. <laughs> happy, happy to do that, Council Member. Um, uh, so uh, Eastside Coastal Resiliency is an example of one of those larger projects that uh, DDC is managing on behalf of the city. It would be certainly reported within the the tracker that you're describing. I think um, uh, it's a good example also because uh, from our perspective, transparency is really critical and valuable with the end goal of it being to improve project delivery. So that's why this is a very important conversation. Um, uh, the reporting of data, uh, we would suggest uh, <coughs> sh sh shouldn't be a substitute for 
uh, regular in-person updating about the status of projects, which is something that is a very critical priority for DDC. And um, uh, Eastside Coastal Resiliency is an example where you will certainly know the status of the project, the various durations, start dates and end dates, contracting, uh, because we are deeply committed to keeping you and your constituents informed uh, through various different levels. So I think that's also an important part of what DDC is, is attempting to do. Yeah, I, 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 I recognize that and that we'll be able to have, and we will have frequent, as we have already, conversations around status of projects. I just also want to make sure the public and, 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 and others, groups that are affected by it, have an opportunity to be able to view that data, even if they're not in the meetings with us. Uh, you got it. You have to. I think I just need you to state your name for the record. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Jamie Torres Springer, the first deputy commissioner of DDC. Thank you. Thank you. And and just one second question. I, I, I as Councilmember Cohen was asking his questions, it made me think about something and other projects that I have, which is, we often fund capital projects here at the council. We outlay money, uh, work with the mayor's office or agencies about what projects are priorities. We put in a 15% contingency, or I think it's 15%, but correct me what, um, what the right number is, and we put money into it. I have gotten in my first year or two, projects come back to me saying, you don't have enough money from the city agencies because some change in scope of work, delay, but I've never hear us come under budget on that, and I, I assume we do, or if we put a contingency fee in, that that money is then, is then put somewhere. So for all funding, millions of dollars of projects, there's contingency fees put in, and if there's no contingency, that money goes somewhere. Where do, what happens to that money when we fund projects in the city, we, or, or the council, we fund projects, we put contingency fees in 15%, maybe it's not 15%, but there is a number, and that money then seems to disappear if we come under budget. I know when it, my point being, I know when it's over because I have to. I'm asked for more money, but I don't know what happens to the money we put in when we go under. I have to get back to you on that. It's a very legitimate question. I and and who would know that? I guess OMB for, OMB. for sure. OMB. Yeah. Okay, I would love an answer to that because I think we are outlaying a lot of money, and we I don't, I don't know what happens to the to the to it when we go on budget or under budget. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gibson. Thank you again, and I, I echo the sentiments of my colleagues, in particular Councilmember Landa, and appreciating your presence and really a willingness to work with us on making significant improvements to the system. Um, someone asked about SCA's quarterly reports and the data that they use in terms of the volume, thousands and thousands of projects. So while you can't sp speak specific to um, the SCA's database, I mean, is that something that you can go back and look at in terms of their operations and what system they use and take away some, you know, just positive things that they're doing uh, that we could really talk about later on in terms of a larger uh, centralized system? Would, does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, we, we certainly can. Okay, so I actually have a couple of questions about DDC, and it was mentioned that recently um, our new um, president announced this strategic blueprint, literally blueprint, and I just wanted to ask a specific question about DDC, because in the MMR, um, DDC reports on the portion of their capital projects that were completed early uh, or on time, as well as the portion of projects that were completed within budget, which is something that we are um, very prideful about, um, and usually is broken down by the project type. So I wanted to ask, um, how does DDC track the statistics that are reported in the actual MMR? So if you could, Deputy Commissioner, press that. Sure, sure. thanks, Council Member. Um, uh, the, so DDC, uh, as was described by Mr. Steinberg, uh, is among the agencies that does have its uh, tracking of uh, project status. Um, in fact, as part of the strategic blueprint that you referenced, um, we noted that we're undergoing a very significant uh, IT transformation plan um, that will involve developing a project management system uh, that will be able to track even better uh, where we stand with our projects. Uh, our payment systems, uh, document management, all the tools that we need to manage delivery of projects. Um, but as part of that uh, information that we track, we are able to identify where projects stand in terms of projected timelines and durations. 
uh, and that's the information that goes into the MMR. Okay, and what system is it that DDC uses to track all of these projects? We're developing a project management system that's, that's uh, been called Benchmark. It's called? It's called Benchmark. Benchmark, okay. So this new system, uh, DDC would use that for all of its agency clients, right? Yeah, we'll use it for all of our projects, Councilmember. We have, okay. as you know, 20 sponsor agencies um, for whom we, we uh, deliver capital projects, and, and we'll use that for tracking all of those projects. Okay, so with the tracking system, what happens in a scenario where a project is delayed, where there is some inconsistency with a particular contract? How does the tracking system actually report that? Um, well, uh, if I may, just, just back up a little, just because you referenced the strategic blueprint, um, we are very focused on uh, delivery on time and on budget uh, for DDC's projects. We've identified the sources of delays. Uh, there are many different circumstances uh, in which we see delays, as all of you know, because we try to report on those. Um, some are uh, because of inadequate scoping and budgeting, uh, which we're remedying with uh, front-end planning, and enhancing the uh, asset information management system that was mentioned. Uh, some we're remedying through improved project management, management of our contractors. Uh, some of it comes from uh, just field conditions in a very complex environment for delivering projects. Uh, and again, we're uh, doing more front end planning, coordinating with utilities. Uh, there are a whole series of initiatives in here that will enable us to deliver uh, more on time and on budget. Part of that, uh, is that our IT system will provide uh, all of the sort of mo you know, modern tools for reporting and tracking projects so that we're aware when, we're, uh, when we have schedule issues. And uh, we're uh, also developing a community relations and government relations uh, structure uh, under a new deputy commissioner at DDC. Uh, and uh, that will uh, sort of notify us when there are issues and concerns with the project, including timing and budget. Uh, so that we're able to communicate about them. Okay. Within DDC, do you have dedicated staff that manages the benchmark system? How does that work? Yes, we do, Council Member. Do you know how many? Um, I'd have to get back to you. We have a chief okay. information officer um, who has a, a number of staff. Um, we've increased that staffing level within our strategic plan and within the preliminary budget proposal from last week. This is a very critical priority for our agency. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I think because DDC, not just because you uh, oversee and manage so many projects with your partner clients, but simply because this is important and we're talking about capital infrastructure. Um, a few years ago, ONB worked very closely with the Parks Department and gave them funds to develop a front, um, a front end planning team. And just based on that, effort, I have seen substantial progress within Parks Department, still understanding that much work needs to be done, but I think the front, um, the front end planning concept is something that has proven that it can work. That coupled with other mechanisms like design build, you know, all of these things working together. So would you say from the perspective of DDC that that unit and that mechanism has been helpful in terms of efficiency and improving project timelines over the course of, of the agency? I, I would, yes, Council Member. Uh, and as uh, my colleague here mentioned, front end planning was a unit or two units, really, um, because we have two sides to our agency, the side that delivers uh, road and sewer reconstruction projects uh, and the side that delivers those public buildings and facilities. So we have two front end planning units. Uh, they were created about a year and a half ago. And uh, as you described, the purpose of that is recognizing that uh, going in and trying to scope a project and budget for a project without being able to get into the capital planning details uh, often results in projects that are very difficult for us to deliver. So we have seen uh, substantial improvement uh, in terms of the quality of the projects in our pipeline as a result of that. And we're very pleased that, uh, as you mentioned, under this uh, strategic blueprint, we are going to be doubling the size of that front end planning, the, both of those front end planning units, um, so that there is additional staff that can provide those services. Okay. 
Um, another part, and I believe it's in the blueprint and just in my general discussions with a number of uh, commissioners, the bidding process is something that we are constantly looking at improving in terms of opening up the arena for more bidders, uh, more entrepreneurs, not the same subset of companies that the city has typically been working with through the years. Um, many of my colleagues and I, we speak to a number of companies and developers, and there's a general frustration where lots of companies don't necessarily want to work with the city because of the cumbersome process, timeliness of getting paid, et cetera. Um, and so I recognize that we are making significant progress, but I also think we need to look at diversifying the bidding process. And so if, you know, just as an example, I know parks is referenced a lot, but you know, not everyone is in the business of building comfort stations. I realize that. Um, but I also think that if we made a real great effort and it was a real priority for us, we could find more companies that are in this business and really make the bidding process more diverse, more reflective of the city. And then when you know we go through that process, if you do have to eliminate companies, you're not left with one, and that one company that you may be stuck with that bid is you know over the cost of the project. And then that's where we come back in and we're being asked to pay more for a project when that was not the original price that we agreed upon. And so just out of the frustration of what we have experienced, I mean, I think the diversifying of the bidding process is another good angle, you know, just as an example. Um, it's a part of that, you know, process that Councilmember Gradenchik talked about that can delay a project and can cause a project to be uh, costly and over the amount that we generally um, specified. So from DDC's perspective, what would you recommend to us in the council in terms of your thoughts on how we can look to get a more centralized system? So the Mayor's Office of Operations and their current capital tracker, what DDC is doing, what Parks is doing, I mean, everyone is doing something different. So just from DDC's perspective, since you do manage so many capital projects, um, what would you recommend? I'm sure it's probably in the report that I have yet to read, um, but what would you say are some of the things that we should be looking at and how this system can be improved? Um, I, so I, I may defer some of the citywide reporting questions to the mayor's office council member, but I do um, uh, would take the opportunity to very much agree with you in your concerns about uh, being able to get uh, a, a broad array and very high quality contractors working on city projects. This is uh, something we recognize is really important. It's not a simple problem. Um, right. Some of it obviously relates to the market that we're in, uh, where there's a lot of demand for contracting services, but uh, there's a lot that we as a city can do to improve on that procurement. Uh, it was mentioned before, um, we have one tool for uh, delivering a project. It's design, bid, build. Um, we have to fully design a project uh, before we bid it out to a contractor. There's a lack of integration between the design and the construction of projects. Uh, that uh, needs to change. It has changed uh, across New York State. It has changed across the country. Um, and uh, a, another uh, element of that, which is our uh, obligation to take the lowest bid that we receive, um, rather than uh, having qualification-based bidding with contractors, uh, is one of the things that really limits our ability to access quality contractors in the pool. Um, as you described, diversifying the uh, pool of smaller contractors, uh, including minority and women uh, business enterprises is a very high priority. We're creating a business development unit to enable us to do that. Uh, one of the things that holds us back from getting a lot of different contractors doing our work is that it's very challenging for us to pay them in a timely way compared to uh, other clients. Uh, and we are uh, remedying that both with our information technology systems that we've described, which will allow us to process payments more quickly and also um, the, the very difficult issue of change orders, um, which do emerge uh, and are part of life in capital project delivery. Um, but uh, what's described in here is DDC is making an effort along with the Office of Management and Budget and the Comptroller's Office uh, to seek allowances that can get built into our contracts for things we know are going to come up. Um, so that we can begin paying them. And we've also reorganized our administration of change orders 
Uh, that's underway right now at the agency, uh, and that should uh, enable us to go from uh, what is currently the case, which is it can take up to a year to pay a change order, um, uh, to us being able to pay within weeks. Uh, so that's a, it's a very exciting set of uh, changes we're making in order to do exactly what you described, Council Member. And okay. we really appreciate your support. Thank uh, you very much. I appreciate that. Expediting uh, the timeliness of getting paid. Uh, that's a huge uh, priority, and I appreciate uh, DDC uh, and the Mayor's Office of Operations for prioritizing that. Just one last question. Um, we mentioned a number of agencies, including DDC and OMB. I uh, wanted to understand, does DOIT have any role or responsibility in terms of uh, managing databases and our tracking system? Uh, well, DOIT uh, manages NYC.gov, which is where the information is displayed. Uh, and they did work with us on the uh, original project to, to build the dashboard. Um, but uh, we manage the, the database in-house. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for coming. I'll turn it back over, but uh, really appreciate uh, your presence here today, and we look forward to working with you. We're going to improve this system. Um, some of us have three years to go, but we're going to improve the system so that we can really give New Yorkers our uh, reassurance that the capital process is more efficient and effective and timely. So thank you so much. Forty of us have three years to go. <laughs> Um, I, can the Deputy Commissioner Springer, we have another question Councilmember Lander wanted to ask of you, so we can bring you back up. <laughs> and then we'll go to Councilmember Levine. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll be brief here. Just um, on the benchmark uh, software, which sounds a lot like what we want to have in some format more broadly to be able to do what we're talking about, can you just give us a sense of the timeline, projected timeline and cost and magnitude of what you're doing in order to provide a system that has a lot of other benefits to DDC as well, but would and make it possible to provide the project updates without individuals going in and entering a separate web form. Sure, uh, Council Member. We, so, um, uh, we are in the midst of a multi-year, multi-million dollar IT strategic plan transformation for the agency. Uh, so I don't have the specific number um, uh, be beyond the, the multi-million figure. Um, uh, this is a critical year in uh, creating that system uh, in terms of the expansion of the preliminary system that we've created. Uh, and it is an automated system that will be tied into other systems you've described like FMS. Um, and uh, so over the course of the, the next uh, 12 to 24 months, we'll be putting in place a number of those critical components. Uh, and then I think, frankly, it will be uh, easier for us to deliver some of the information that you've uh, described. Um, uh, and, and then the only other thing I'd say is that, uh, as, as you mentioned, Council Member, uh, this is not only about the public reporting, which we understand is critical, the transparency is critical to uh, project delivery improvement, it's also a management tool for us, um, for our projects, and it's also a communications management tool for uh, our folks within the agency who we are adding staff to that capacity to interact with you and community boards and borough boards and critical stakeholders in each district and each community to give them regular updates, um, which I, you know, I would say uh, tracking and transparency is important, but the nuances of why things are happening um, have to be described as well, and that's what that system will allow us to do as well. Absolutely. I, uh, another example of something that I don't think should be a part of the public reporting tool but seems critical to me is keeping an eye on contractors who are performing and not performing. So if somebody is in the midst of defaulting on a project over here, uh, the same agency in a different division or another agency over here would know that was, and they were considering bids, would right now, they, they probably don't know that that default is happening over here unless Vendex have been updated long later. Like we don't have a real-time system for managing contractor performance currently, right? Um, we, we generally, that information would generally be shared, yes. Have that, ha that across agencies currently? Okay, well that's good to know. Um, Okay, so, um, and I wonder, I guess, since, um, you know, Commissioner uh, Grillo is also, remains President Grillo, you obviously have some sense of the, of these interconnections, and I guess I wonder, maybe two questions, one simple and one slightly harder. Um, 
you know, the harder one is, you know, based on what you're hearing today, what you've seen from your work at EDC, which of course is managing a whole other set of separate projects, um, and now at, at DDC, um, do you have some insights that are worth adding about how we build something that connects across agencies to do what you're trying to do right now at DDC? And hopefully simpler, can we have your commitment to be part of this process as we're working to figure out how to negotiate this in a way which not only lands the bill, but puts us on a track to where we want to be systemically? Um, I think that's, I guess that's directed at me, and I, yes. I, I would certainly say, Council Member, that we uh, welcome the, the, the move towards transparency. Um, as I think has been described, this is a very complex uh, endeavor across agencies. Um, so from our narrow perspective of uh, the Department of Design and Construction, we're building out the capacity over the next 12 to 24 months to be able to more adequately report on that. Um, and, and then I would defer the additional questions to my, my colleagues from the mayor's office here. Yeah. I asked you guys this before, so you don't need to answer it again. I, um, all right, that's helpful. I think the extra information just on understanding benchmark um, and thinking about you know, the role DDC can play with mayor's office of operations as we move forward here is, is useful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Member Levine. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and, and Chair Gibson. And um, congratulations, Councilmember Lander, on amazing, amazing work on this uh, and this report and your questioning today. Uh, I have been focusing on one piece of this challenge, which is the Parks Capital Project process. Uh, we actually had a hearing last week on this topic looking at uh, a bill, Intro 161, that would strengthen the capital tracker I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, again and again and again in the Parks hearings, the MMR comes up because you have a very strange way of tracking the on-time status of parks projects, which um, if, if one looks at the MMR, shows an 88% on-time rate. And any council member familiar with projects in their district is going to be perplexed by that. And we have figured out the disconnect, which is you're only measuring one of uh, what I would consider four stages of the capital project, uh, process, which is construction. So. There could be delays uh, between when a project's funded and when design starts. There could be delays in the design process. There could be delays in procurement. But as long as the construction was on time, we're declaring success. Why don't we measure on time rates based on the full lifespan of the projects? I'm familiar with the issue that you, that you raised and, and, and saw the hearing the other day. Um, it's something we're willing to look at in relation to the MMR, the Mayor's Office of Operations, but that's currently the definition of the indicator, and, and we're, you know, um, um, but, but we're aware of the issue. And, and, that, and that's decided at. by uh, your office? Who determines the indicators? Yeah, in, in, it's, a, it's a sort of collaboration, um, but, but um, it's something that, that's existed for a while, but, um, but we're aware of the issue. And, and are you already working on the next MMR? It's, it comes out in a couple of weeks, but um, can we expect improvement on the parks measure in that document? Th in two weeks, the indicator will remain the same in terms of the definition. But but in between um, MMRs, we look at all sorts of issues like this. So in in two weeks, we'll know uh, what the new indicator will be and and what those. No, in two weeks, we'll simply report out the data on the indicator as it's currently defined. But but this is something we're, we're okay. Very it's happy it's to look it's at. really important that we get this right. Um, it's, it's basically a useless measure at this point. It's, it's, in fact, it's a negative because it confuses people. Um, the Parks Capital Tracker, which I know has been referenced a lot here, um, is a huge step forward. And I do want to give credit uh, to Commissioner Silver, who I think has been per very personally invested in that project. There's ways it could be made even better. And so as you're considering a citywide replication, which I strongly encourage, um, I hope that you examine some of the ways that we believe this can be made even better. Um, and uh, I, w I won't uh, list out every detail in, in the bill as we proposed, but we do think some explanation for delays could be helpful. We do think more details on the timing of the funding of projects can be helpful, and the source of funding can be helpful. Um, and we have some things which are relatively trivial, uh, such as what council district it's in and, and other 
pieces of information which, which should be easy to determine. So I, I hope that as you look to take a capital tracker citywide or a, across all agencies, that you um, try and evolve to the next level, uh, incorporating some of our, our most recent uh, requests. I, I, I really believe that countdown clocks on subways are a great metaphor for what we're doing here. It doesn't end the delay, but just having the information is incredibly helpful. And I think in the capital process, having the accurate information will be helpful for the public and for policymakers, for accountability and transparency. And it, it's, it's, central, it's simply essential to solving this problem. All right. Thank, thank you. you. We, and we thank agree. you to the chairs. Okay. And thank you again uh, to Councilmember Lander. We share your vision of making it more resident centric. That's, that's certainly driving our, our sort of mentality in, in terms of how it's improved over time. So. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember thank you. Adams. Thank you for being here today, and thank you to both chairs for having this hearing. Very important. Um, I'm a former member of the Board of Trustees for the Queens Public Library System, and uh, I'm sure you know that the backlog for the libraries has been extreme, um, exponentially. Um, but I just wanted to back up. I just wanted to put a plug in for the libraries right now. Um, I just wanted to back up a little bit. My question is simply, uh, did we get a response to Councilmember Landers um, question earlier about the, the tracker itself, the capital projects dashboard tracker itself, and when, uh, when the, uh, the overdue projects would be looked at or tried to bring them up to speed and try to get them current. Did we get an actual answer on when that's going to be addressed? M meaning when will the, up the tracker be updated? Yes, uh, to, to become current. Yeah, that, that, that's ongoing now. It's, all, it's currently yeah. ongoing. As we said, it's a manual process, so it, it, it takes a, a few weeks to, for that all to all be completed. Okay, and did we get, I'm sorry if I'm backtracking, did we get uh, an idea of how many people actually work on those updates on a daily basis? Well, if you include, well, including agency resources, yeah. that's, that's a, a, a big analytical task because so many people are involved across the city. Um, so we don't have that at our fingertips. We're happy to get back to you with that. How many agencies? There is over 20 agencies in the tracker, um, so in that ballpark. Over 20 agencies are working on the tracker on a daily basis? Or not, not on, a, on a daily basis. Uh, when, you know, the, the data is updated three times a year, um, and so at that time, the agencies pull data out of their own systems and, and put it in, into our intake form. Okay, and I'm going to ask another question. I apologize if I'm sounding redundant. I'm just trying to get clarity. So at any particular time of the year, a designated time of the year, everybody is getting on the system to update the tracker at the same time? Three times a year. All right. Well, not, yeah. Okay. Three times a year with the release of the capital budget. And there is a start date and a, and a cutoff date to when that information is entered? Uh, correct. You sure? We w uh, we, <laughs> we <laughs> send a notice out to agencies that it's it's time to receive the the current data, and With they send it to us, and um, then we refresh the system. Okay, that was my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, with that, we're going to uh, stop here. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and thank you for coming in. And we're going to call up our next witness. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that will be Elizabeth Brown from the New York City Independent Budget Office. <clears throat> no, I don't think so. Yeah. Can I get a copy of this also? I don't think I got this. Operation Daniel? Yeah. Or DDC, I'm sorry. Yeah, DDC. All right, Elizabeth, uh, we're going to swear you in, okay? Sure. Thank you. 
Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Okay, please begin. Good morning, Chairman Drum, Chairwoman Gibson, and members of the Committee of Finance and Subcommittee on Capital. I am Elizabeth Brown, a supervising analyst at the New York City Independent Budget Office. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding intros 113 and 32. Both intros would expand the information the city is required to report on its capital projects. IBO's role is to provide inf nonpartisan information on the city's budget to members of the city council, other elected officials, and the public at large. Although we generally do not make recommendations, we support increasing government transparency, especially when it comes to budgeting. And for disclosing the additional information of the sort required by the intros being discussed today, particularly when that information is made available to the public. IBO often receives questions about the city's capital, budget pro capital projects. These questions range from status of a local project to broader questions about the city's capital budgeting process. While we can provide information on changes in the overall budget and, the shifts, and shifts in funding for specific projects, we often run into roadblocks when trying to identify and explain the causes of project delays and cost overruns, which are often what requesters most want to know. Identifying a delay or a cost overrun for a specific capital project is difficult given the nature of New York City's capital commitment plan, the city's capital planning document. First, the capital commitment plan is divided by budget line and then by project. A project may be either for discrete work, for example, the reconstruction of First Avenue in Brooklyn, or it may be for a bundle of similar projects, for example, improvements to highway bridges and structures citywide. How capital projects are defined varies widely both among city agencies, but often within one agency's capital plan. Next, while the commitment plan provides the total funding plan for a project, however it's defined, there is little detail on the funding for the project's individual components. Moreover, it is often unclear if the funding levels represent the total estimated cost of the project. If funding is increased in subsequent plans, it can be difficult to discern whether the new funding level represents an increase in cost, which would be an overrun, a change in scope, or if the additional funds were part of the, in, part of the initial estimate, the cost estimate, but are just newly reflected in the city's budget documents. In terms of delays, the city's capital commitment plan provides very little detail on the plan time frame for a capital project. The commitment plan does contain a milestone field to indicate the project's current status along with the project's start and end dates. Unfortunately, these fields are generally left blank. Even when status is included, it is rarely updated in between plans. Last week, IBO provided similar testimony, similar testimony at a hearing of the Committee on Parks and Recreation regarding Intro 161, which would expand the information the Parks Department is required to report on, an, on its online Capital Parks Trapper that was discussed today. We find that a useful tool that already provides detail on each Parks Capital Project's location, phase, funding level, and timeline. The new data required by Intro 161 would include information on the reasons for a capital project delay and the cause and extent of cost overruns, similar to what is required in Intro 113. The Parks Tracker is a valuable resource that we use routinely and we often assist members of the public in using it as well. Given IBO's support for increased transparency and data sharing in general, the Enhanced Parks Cap tra Capital project, project Tracker could be an example for other agencies on how to communicate progress and provide detailed information on their capital projects. Thank you and I'm happy to answer questions. Very good. I um, did not attend the uh, Parks hearing that you referenced in your testimony but I understand that um, it was um, very worthwhile. Um, a lot of my frustrations uh, are similar to what I hear, I hear was um, referenced in that hearing. Um, and even with um, the uh, tracking system that they currently have on their uh, website, it's oftentimes not updated and difficult to follow as well. And I find that sometimes even park staff do not know uh, what that uh, tracking system says or disagree with it. So um, I appreciate you coming in and sharing your observations as well. And I think that's what we're about is, is about transparency also, is that we know what's going on. So Chair Gibson? Yep. Yep. All right, well, we appreciate it very much. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. And uh, thank you for giving testimony. And seeing nobody else, we are going to adjourn this hearing at 12.02 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>